If you take a look at Fallon True Crime on Instagram, you'll see that I joined a new club, and I couldn't have joined at a better time. I was down to my last disposable razor, which was blunt, and I was dreading my next shave. And so when the package arrived from Dollar Shave Club, I couldn't wait to give it a test run. And my verdict? I'm really impressed. When you join the club, there's no reason to deal with the hassle of going to the store to buy expensive razors. Just go to dollarshaveclub.com and pick a razor that works for you from their lineup of awesome blades. It's as simple as that. I can now get a first class shave with my executive razor and combined with the Dr. Carver's shave butter, the blade just gently glides for the smoothest shave imaginable. And so, here's your chance to see why over 3 million members like me love Dollar Shave Club. Right now, you can get your first month of the club for as little as $5. After that, it's just a few bucks a month. Dollar Shave Club is so confident in the quality and value of all their products, there's no long-term commitment or any hidden fees. There's no reason not to join. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash felon. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash felon. This episode of Felon may contain disturbing content including descriptions of violence and coarse language. Listener discretion is advised. Blaspheming God, my body was possessed, the essence of the spirits at evil, burning my flesh, inhaling, no regrets, a diabolic sentence of destruction, burning a bleed, unholy incision, mark of the beast, behold the trifiction, prepare the tool to observe my fate, upon this mortal shell, in Satan's name, I desecrate. Evil controlling the way I die. The mark is what distorts my soul beyond my sanity. Glenn Benton Wollongong is a scenic seaside city on the east coast of New South Wales, approximately 80 kilometres or 50 miles south of the New South Wales capital of Sydney. A 20 minute drive south from the city of Wollongong Along the Prince's Motorway is the suburb Albion Park. Approximately midway between the city of Wollongong and Albion Park is the suburb of Dapto. It was here in Dapto that a passerby noticed something unusual. Approximately 8.30am on Saturday the 13th of June 1998, crates of milk and bread sat untouched at the doors of a corner store on Kanahuka Road. This in itself wasn't peculiar. The store would often receive goods, and they'd be left at the shop front, but it struck the driver as odd, because it was well past opening time, and the doors were still locked up. The delivery sat on the footpath, uncollected. The passerby was a friend of the shopkeeper who ran the store, 63-year-old David O'Hearn. David resided in the nearby suburb of Albion Park, and would make the short trip north to Dapto every day, and open the store at the same time. He had established a good rapport with his customers, and many remember interactions with him fondly. He was known for his friendly smile, and was always up for a chat. David ran the type of store where he knew the customers by name, and if they were short of cash, he would run up a tab for them. He was also known to be reliable and punctual, and so, when on the morning of Saturday the 13th, he had failed to open up his store, his friend, who happened to be passing by, quickly became concerned for his well-being. This prompted his friend to call his son, Josh. Josh had worked in David's shop for a number of years when he was in school, and at times, he would still work for him casually. 
Josh also knew that it would be out of character for David to neglect his shop and not open for the day, especially if a delivery was arriving. Josh quickly tried calling David's home phone, but there was no answer. He tried calling his mobile phone, still no answer. He then attempted to call a number of David's relatives until he got hold of Chris, David's sister. Chris, along with her husband, were joined by Josh, his younger brother and father, and they made their way to David's home in Albion Park to make sure David was okay. But they would soon discover that they had good reason to be worried. This group of David's family and friends banged on the front door. There was no answer. They rapped on the windows and tried to peer through, but the blinds were all down. The veranda light was still on and his car was still in the driveway, and so they assumed he couldn't be far away. They tried turning the handle of the front door. It was unlocked. Chris, along with Josh, cautiously opened the door and eased themselves through, making their way towards the living room. It was here that they made a gruesome discovery. David's body was found lying on the living room floor of his townhouse. He had been decapitated and his head had been placed in the kitchen sink. Josh and Chris ran from the scene. Such was their shock that they both required treatment by ambulance officers. The authorities were quickly alerted and uniformed police hurried to the scene to secure the area. They filmed and took photos. They dusted for fingerprints located and collected blood samples. All items of interest were documented, bagged and taken away for further testing. A closer inspection revealed a series of intricate and gruesome mutilations performed on the body. David's left hand had been severed and was lying on a couch in the lounge room. A post-mortem report revealed the following. There were deep incisions to the abdomen and wounding extended from just above the sternum down to the midpoint of the abdomen. Five intersecting and parallel incised wounds on the lower chest affecting both right and left sides and the wounding of the abdomen exposed the shaft of a hammer which had been inserted through the anus. The head of this hammer was visible between the buttocks of the deceased and the deceased was lying with his jeans and underpants lower to a point about the knees. The deceased penis had been mutilated and intestinal material had been disturbed. Near the foot of the deceased was found a silver colored tray on which a section of bowel was resting. On the breakfast bar in the kitchen, a number of sections of intestine were found lying. There were found on the floor near the deceased a number of knives and implements either used to mutilate the body or put there in contemplation of such intended use. These items included a small metal saw, four knives, a razor blade, and a corkscrew. There was much blood staining on the carpet near the body, and there was a blood splatter on items of furniture and curtains. There was blood smearing on a table, on which wine decanters were located, and the word Satan had been written on a mirror suspended above that table. The word Satan had also been written in blood on the wall above the lounge upon which the severed hand was resting and above that word also written in blood was a pentagram on the wall beside the television set an inverted cross had been drawn in blood as disturbing as the sight of this crimson graffiti was even more disturbing was the means by which it had been put there the victim's severed hand had been used as a makeshift paintbrush to smear the blood into letters and symbols. Once the crime scene officers had all that they needed, under the lead of Detective Inspector Peter Woods, his team entered David O'Hearn's residence to continue the investigation. A lucky break for police came when they discovered fingerless gloves on the kitchen sink that were damp and had been turned inside out. This suggested that the offender had most likely worn them during the attack and had removed them afterwards. This gave them hope that the fingerprints they had located when dusting for them could possibly belong to the attacker. The entire premises had been ransacked and it seemed to the investigators that the offender 
may have been searching for something. It also seemed to police that the offender had spent quite some time in the home, which was made evident by the very deliberate nature of the mutilation and the writing of messages on the wall. Robbery was considered as a motive, but the extreme nature of the injuries inflicted suggested something much more violent, committed by someone with a lot of anger. To locals around Dapto, Dave O'Hearn was the friendly face behind the counter of the corner store. They can't understand how anyone could kill him, especially in such a horrible way. I just can't imagine him being involved in anything that would warrant what he went through. A team of detectives was assigned to carry out a background check of David and to look at any possible leads based on any associates, dealings he had with people and his general day-to-day activities. A timeline of his last known movements was quickly established. On the evening of Friday the 12th of June, David left his corner store alone at his usual closing time of 5pm. Police believe he made it home safely based on the fact that in his car were some bags of groceries from a local shopping centre. Along with these groceries was a receipt time stamped at 5.35pm. This, along with CCTV footage of the shopping centre, confirmed that he had made the purchase. A nurse, who was a carer for his elderly mother, spoke with David as he was leaving the shop, and during their conversation, he indicated that he was planning to visit his mother the next day. This would be the last known person to have contact with him. Based on the nurse's account, he seemed happy, and there was nothing to suggest he was anxious about anything or anyone. Something worth noting for police was the fact that the groceries found in the boot of his car contained perishables. This established with them an approximate time he may have had contact with his attacker as he had not had time to remove them from his car upon arriving home. As detectives delved into David's day-to-day life and thoroughly into his past, they were unable to establish any leads as to anyone who would wish him harm. And David's sister Chris was at a loss as to who would harbour such malice towards her brother, who she described as a kind and gentle person who was impossible for someone to hate. Due to the state of David's clothing, his pants and underwear being pulled down, and the sexual nature of the mutilation, police looked at the possibility of the murder being a homophobic attack as David O'Hearn was gay, something that Chris was aware of, but a fact that he kept low-key with family. But... An exploration of this as a potential motivation failed to turn up any leads. With family, friends and neighbours still unable to provide anything further, police were under the impression the crime had been committed by someone who was a stranger to David. An autopsy indicated that the fatal injuries had been delivered by a crystal wine decanter prior to the mutilation. The fractures located in David's skull were matched to the shape of the decanter and blood and hair samples found on it confirmed this. The injuries had been inflicted to the back of the skull and this, combined with there being no sign of a struggle, suggested the attack came from behind and that it was unexpected. But this would not be the only clues they gained from the murder weapon. An analysis for fingerprints would soon yield some hopeful results. The wine decanter was put inside a superglue chamber. This involved heating superglue to form a vapour that then settles on the surface and in turn highlights any fingerprints present on the object. As the vapour settled on the decanter, a fingerprint slowly became visible. This fingerprint did not belong to David O'Hearn and police now had the best lead so far, but a comparison of the fingerprint to those in the police database failed to come back with any matches, indicating the offender had not been charged with anything prior. But the clue that would give them the next big break had been the most obvious all along. And that was in the form of the bloody imagery left at the scene. A man found murdered in his home on the south coast may have been the victim of a satanic cult. The macabre case just south of Wollongong has detectives baffled. The walls and mirror featured graffiti that displayed symbols of the occult. The word Satan a pentagram, an inverted cross. The next line of inquiry was dedicated to looking at local individuals who were seen to be associated with such imagery or activity. The questioning of locals in the area led police 
to become aware of an individual by the name of Keith Schreiber. Schreiber had been observed in having leanings towards the occult, satanic music and imagery. A point of interest to police was that Keith Schreiber lived only a few doors down from David O'Hearn. Upon receiving this information, they quickly attempted to track him down. Arriving at Schreiber's home, they were greeted by his housemate, who invited the police to inspect Schreiber's room. Upon entering, they were greeted by a number of posters featuring death metal bands and satanic imagery. A closer look revealed a series of sketches hand-drawn by Schreiber. These contained mutilation, disembowelment, and decapitation. Attending officers found them disturbingly reminiscent of the crime scene. This information confirmed Schreiber as a very firm suspect, and police wasted no time in tracking him down. When he was located, he was at his place of employment, a fish market where he gutted and filleted fish. With his occupation requiring him to use a knife all day, this set off even more alarm bells for police, and they felt they were close to solving the brutal murder of David O'Hearn. Keith Schreiber was questioned by detectives as to his whereabouts on the night in question. His alibi was a claim that he had spent the night sleeping on his boss's floor in preparation for an early morning at the market the next day. This was confirmed by both his boss and housemate. And yet again, police were left without a solid lead. Two weeks had passed since the investigation commenced, and it seemed they were not any closer to solving the murder, but the investigator's workload would soon be doubled when they would be faced with another murder similar to that of David's. Next time on Felon. Former MP and alleged pedophile Frank Arkell murdered in his Wollongong home. His killer is being hunted by the same team of detectives investigating the decapitation murder of another man at nearby Albion Park Rail two weeks ago. What's happened with David O'Hearn? Are they linked? What is the commonalities between the two? Police have set up a new task force to investigate Mr O'Kell's murder. It will work closely with another team looking into the violent death of David O'Hearn. Could you stand up, please? And you, if you can indicate, if Detective Kasser is walking away that way, if you can just indicate what you did with him. Yep. So the walk. And bang, hit him on the head, and he slumped down there. And I continued to hit him on the head with a bottle. It was some fancy glass bottle, just like well rounded. And um, it was really heavy. It was like cut through his stomach, and I cut his head off. I cut his hand off. Thanks for listening. If you've been enjoying the podcast, and you'd like to provide additional support, please do subscribe, rate and review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast app. You can get in touch through all the usual social media platforms. Just search for Fallon True Crime. This episode was brought to you by Dollar Shave Club. To take advantage of their special offer, you can visit dollarshaveclub.com slash felon.